Hello, and welcome to the Penguin Prof channel. In today's episode, I want to talk about the cell cycle and mitosis. Don't be too afraid. I know this looks pretty ugly, but of course, we're going to have some fun with it. And I'm going to introduce you to all the players that are involved and hopefully make this pretty easy to understand. And of course, there's cleavage. So, I mean, you know, what else do you want? Have you ever felt, I don't know, lonely? Have you ever thought to yourself, gosh, there's really no one I can talk to that understands me? What if you could clone yourself? I know for some that's a scary thought, but if you're a single cell organism or a colonial organism, cell division actually allows you to do that. Uh, for these guys, it's all about reproduction. And cell division is important for single cell organisms, for colonial organisms like this coral. Uh, they can grow asexually by cloning themselves. They can also reproduce sexually where they shuffle their genes. But this basic cell division we're going to be talking about today is important for them. It's also important for us because this is the kind of division that allows for the development of a single fertilized egg into a baby. And of course, it allows for you to replace cells that get worn out or damaged. So cell division is really important. But there are a lot of challenges and problems that we have to deal with. You have to make sure that when one cell divides into two, the daughter cells, they're just called daughter cells by convention, they must be identical. And the management of DNA is key. We're talking about a lot of DNA for humans. We're talking about 6 billion base pairs with about 50,000 protein encoding genes. This is a lot of DNA. If you stretched it out, there would be six feet of it. How are you going to manage all of that? If you couldn't imagine that, I went ahead and got six feet of, of string, and it's kind of a mess. But if you coil it up, it's actually a lot easier to manage. And this is actually what the cells do with their DNA. So when the cell isn't reproducing its DNA or dividing, it exists in a loose, kind of uncoiled formation called chromatin. But when the cell is going to be dividing, all of that DNA gets organized into big groups called chromosomes. So these are what human chromosomes look like. When we sort them out by size, we call this a karyotype. And you can see how the cell organizes all of the genomic material so that it's easier to manage during the process of cell division. It's critical that we manage it because if you lose even a tiny part of a chromosome, the results can be catastrophic and can lead to disease, or death to the cell or the organism. So this is really serious business. So the cell cycle is going to involve this kind of an, an overview. We're going to have a parent cell with the genetic material shown in red and blue. There's going to be a stage where the DNA is going to be replicated. And then you're going to see the classic X shape of the chromosomes. And then there's a distribution phase. So you're going to have half of each of the X's being moved to opposite sides of the cell, and then the cell is going to divide in two. So in terms of the big picture, that's what's going to have to happen. Now, there's a huge misconception alert here. A lot of people think that the replication of DNA is part of mitosis, and it is not. You have to duplicate the DNA before mitosis begins. So we're going to see here in a second at what phase the DNA is actually replicated, but it is not during mitosis. Okay, so we're going to talk about the life of a cell. And my mentor, Todd Newberry, said that organisms organize space with structures and time with life cycles. And so I want to share with you the life cycle of a cell. You can basically divide the cell's life cycle into two periods when the cell is not dividing and when it is dividing. And actually the cell spends most of its time not dividing. This non-dividing phase we call interphase. Inter means between. And the cell division stage we refer to as cell division. And of course we're going to subdivide these into more phases because that's going to allow us to look at different events that occur. So interphase is divided into three subphases, the gap one, the synthesis, and the gap two phase. And we'll talk briefly about what happens there. 
And then the cell division phase is actually subdivided into two phases, mitosis, which is the division of the genetic material, the DNA, and then the cytokinesis, which is the division of everything else. So the, the cytoplasm and the actual creation of two cells occurs during cytokinesis. So during gap one, this is when the cell has just finished division. So it's generally very small in size and it has a lot of growing to do. It has a lot of needs in terms of metabolism and some preparation for DNA synthesis. The S phase, the synthesis phase, is when the DNA gets replicated and that is also when the centrosomes, these are organelles that we're going to see in a few minutes, they play a critical role in cell division. They get replicated as well. So DNA is not replicated during mitosis. It is replicated during the synthesis phase of interphase. So that's your big misconception alert there. The gap two is going to be more growth. Uh, more synthesis of proteins, a lot of synthesis of things that are going to be needed in order to go through the cell division process. So a lot of microtubules, as you're going to see in just a bit. And um, those are the phases of interphase. Now, a little bit more about chromosome structure is going to be very helpful at this point. These chromosomes are always drawn like X's and they actually do look like this. This is the real structure. So it's an X and there's a centromere at the center. If you were to divide the chromosome in half, what you would see is that each half is a replicated sister of the other half. So we call these sides chromatids. So you have one sister chromatid on one side of the centromere and on the other that's the other sister chromatid. So you can sort of think of them as identical twins that are joined in the center at the centromere. Now one more interesting thing about chromosomes is they have to have something that the microtubules can attach to during cell division, sort of like handles. And those handles are called kinetochores. Kinetochores are actually made of protein and they're attached to each side of the sister chromatid. The shape of the kinetochore varies by species. They're actually rather complicated. As you can see, there are plates which attach to the centromere itself. There's an inner zone and an outer zone and the structures are very interesting. But for our purposes, you can sort of think of it as a handle or an attachment point where specialized microtubules are going to attach. And this is basically the structure that's gonna allow the chromosome to attach to the organizing fiber during cell division. So when we move these chromosomes around, what's going to be needed here? We've got centrosomes. Centrosomes are microtubule organizing centers. These are organelles that are replicated along with the DNA during the S phase of interphase. During mitosis, you'll see them often referred to as spindle poles because they actually organize each of the two poles of the cell during cell division. Now, these centrosomes have to be anchored in some way. You've got to hold them down so they don't move. And the structures that do that are called astral microtubules. Astral means star-like, right? Like an asteroid. So, uh, because that's what they look like. These are microtubules that anchor in the same way that uh, stakes can be used to anchor a tent. So they're going to hold these centrosomes in place at either end of the cell. Now we're also going to have microtubules that will interact with the chromosomes themselves and those are called kinetochore microtubules. So the kinetochore microtubules are attached to the centrosome on one end and they're attached to the chromosomes at the other via, you guessed it, the kinetochores. So now you have a way to move the chromosomes around by actually changing the tension of the microtubules. And we're going to see what happens when the chromosomes start to move uh, as we go through the phases of mitosis. Now when we go back to the cell cycle, we're going to look at specifically mitosis and the phases of mitosis. Uh, we're going to go through each stage, kind of give you some tips on how to recognize each stage because most likely you'll have to recognize it on an exam. Just a quick note that most textbooks have now adopted pro-metaphase but not all instructors or all textbooks have included that. So as you might imagine, uh, events in pro-metaphase 
used to be split between prophase and, and metaphase, but it's been decided that the phase is distinct enough to warrant its own name. Because of course you needed something else to learn, right? Okay, so what happens during prophase? There's a couple of things that should stand out. The first thing is that chromatin condenses into visible chromosomes. So under a light microscope, chromatin, which is the thin thread-like form of DNA, it's too thin to see under a light microscope. So once you start to see chromosomes forming, you know you're looking at prophase. Um, the nucleolus disappears. So the nucleolus is the extra dark staining part of the nucleus. That's the structure that makes ribosomes. That disappears. It disintegrates. You can't see it anymore. And this is when microtubule assembly begins. We've got a lot of microtubules to make. I already mentioned some of them, and there's actually even a couple more. Isn't this gorgeous? This is such a great image. You're looking at two mouse cell nuclei in prophase. And this image was captured with what's called three-dimensional structured illumination microscopy. And you see the nuclear membranes there in blue and the microtubules in green. Oh, that's just so pretty. Uh, certainly one of the prettiest images of prophase that I could find. Here's prometaphase. You're going to see the nuclear membrane breaking down, so it disintegrates. It Basically, the membrane will break apart, and the lipids will just be broken down and, and form little vesicles that you can't see anymore under the light microscope. The kinetochore microtubules form, and they start to attach to the kinetochores of each of the sister chromatids on the chromosomes. Polar microtubules, now I didn't mention those, but they function to push the centrosomes apart. So the centrosomes have to be moved to opposite poles, and the polar microtubules are responsible for that. And the astral microtubules, those are like the stakes for the tent, those assemble and then anchor the centrosomes at opposite poles. So as you can see, prometaphase actually involves a lot of important steps. Next we have metaphase. And in metaphase, this is usually a very clear phase to identify, the chromosomes line up on what we call the metaphase plate. The metaphase plate is not a structure. In the same way that the equator is not a real structure, right? It's just a plane of, of symmetry. Of course, if you go to some places in the world, this is Mitad del Mundo in Ecuador, they actually have beautiful monument there to the scientists who worked out lines of longitude and latitude. And you can actually have a cheesy tourist photo taken. Uh, these are a couple of my students where you can stand in the northern hemisphere and the southern hemisphere at the same time. But the equator is not a real line, okay? And in the same way, the metaphase plate is not a real structure. So the analogy here is going to be a tug of war game where you can have two kids playing and the children would be the centrosomes and they're tugging on ropes and the ropes are attached to these chromosomes. And so you have the ability to change the tension on the ropes to move the chromosomes back and forth. So yes, you can try this at home. In anaphase, we're going to have the separation. So the chromosomes are going to break at the centromere into the sister chromatids. And the sister chromatids are going to move toward opposite poles of the cell. So if you were looking at this little game, you would split your chromosomes in half and you have the big separation. Oh no, my sisters. Look how pretty that is. Isn't that gorgeous? Oh, some of these new imaging techniques are just amazing. Telophase. In telophase, the sister chromatids, now for convention, they're now called daughter chromosomes. So that can be very confusing. They begin to decondense. So they condense during prophase. They decondense during telophase. They go back to the long thread-like chromatin. The nuclear membrane begins to reform around each set of the daughter chromosomes. And if it's a plant, a new cell wall begins to form. If it's an animal, you get the formation of something called the cleavage furrow. This is a contractile ring. And for some reason, everybody just loves cleavage. We have a real fascination with cleavage. I don't know why. Now we've got toe cleavage. This is pretty famous. There's actually an anatomical name. Of course there is. That's called the intergluteal cleft. Try to use that in a pickup line. Good luck with that. So cleavage furrows, you see cleavage all over the place. Here are some ciliates. I mean, I don't know. 
That's pretty sexy if you ask me. Formation of plant cell walls, probably not so sexy. They don't have this cleavage furrow, uh, mainly because they have these very, very tough cellulose cell walls that have to form instead. A good question is how often cells divide. Well, it depends on the type of cell. If you look at things like adult neurons and skeletal muscle, those don't divide at all. They're just too specialized. Cells like hepatocytes, these are in the liver. Uh, these will divide if they're stimulated to do so. So you may know that the liver can actually regenerate. Some cells can do that. But some cells divide all the time. Epithelial cells, most notably, like cells in your stomach. Your stomach lining is, it, your stomach is a nasty place, pH of 2. Cells don't live very long there. So one of their strategies for coping is they divide a lot. So the lining of your stomach today is not going to be the lining of your stomach two to three days from now. So that's a lot of cell division. One of the most interesting research questions that people are looking at right now is how cells, I'm going to put in quotes, know when to divide. Research-wise, a lot of people are looking at these things. There are checkpoints during the cell cycle. There's a G1 check. There's a G2 check to make sure that the DNA has been replicated correctly. There's actually an M check to make sure the sister chromatids are attached to the spindle fibers. Um, but this is a big area of research right now because if these checks do not work and there's a problem, um, this is where cancers can develop. This is a PET scan of a patient with lung cancer. So cancers occur when cells divide uncontrollably. And obviously that's a big problem that we're very interested in understanding more about. Certainly with lung cancer, we do know that irritants and things that make the cells uncomfortable, that induces cell division. So one of the best things you can do is, of course, not to smoke. Had to get that in there. As always, I hope this was helpful. Thank you so much for visiting the Penguin Prof channel. Please show your support by clicking those buttons, like, share, and subscribe. Visit on Facebook, follow on Twitter. Good luck.